Thank you very much uh, for your attention so far. Uh, okay, my name is Andy Ramatsky. Uh, I'm at the University of Leeds. Uh, this work is done in collaboration with uh, people in Bristol. And actually, uh, one, of the, one of the main authors that did uh, a lot of the measurements here is Asher, who is now an accountant, uh, but was an undergraduate uh, project student at the time that this work was done. Uh, so, yeah, so thank you, thank you for inviting me along, Barbara, and for organising what's been a really great meeting so far. Uh, in some ways, I also feel like a bit of a fraud. I'm a part-timer when it comes to looking at intermediate and deep seismicity and earthquakes. But the story I'm going to tell you today, I hope, will be of interest to you. Um, so before I go on, I'm just going to plug a meeting that we're hosting in London in May. It's a uh, uh, Royal Astronomical Society specialist discussion meeting, which means it's free and open for people to attend. And I hope that some of you might like to come along to that in May next year, where we're going to continue the discussion. And this, this meeting actually happens after a two-day meeting about more general, deeper things. Okay, so shameless plug over there. Let's move on. Okay, so, um, so this, this talk is going to be about anisotropy, seismic anisotropy inside the Earth's transition zone, or, or, or where is it exactly, is sort of the question we'll address. And uh, really, for a long time, people have assumed, they had assumed that the Earth's transition zone should be isotropic or, or shouldn't show any strong seismic anisotropy. Uh, and we'll discuss the reasons why that assumption was made shortly. Um, but increasingly, it's become apparent that this isn't a good enough approximation, and there is anisotropy in the transition zone. Uh, if we take it, and so the, the the trick is though we don't really have yet a strong handle on exactly where it occurs in the transition zone. Uh, you, it seems likely that the sort of tectonically interesting parts where the slabs are could be responsible, but we're sort of we're only slowly converging on an answer here. Uh, if I point you to this uh, plot on the top right, this is a, a sort of a radial average of this value of the xi parameter, my least favourite Greek letter to write. And um, xi just means the ratio squared of the velocity of this sh wave, the horizontally polarised s wave, to the vertically polarised wave. So it's, it's a squared ratio of those velocities. And this is in an hexagonal symmetry, so we're assuming transverse isotropy and hexagonal symmetry. And so when this psi number is bigger than one, that means that SH is fast. And when it's less than one, that means that SV is fast. Now, we've um, got better and better at uh, in, within this uh, approximation of vertical transverse isotropy, where the, the Earth is hexagonally symmetric and it has a vertical symmetry axis. We've got sort of better and better at interpreting our data in terms of that. And now there's a, a series of tomography models, I think Anna Ferrer would agree, increasing in how good they are as you go to the right. Um, not sure Barbara would agree necessarily. Um, but there's, uh, as I say, there's at least two experts in this room now who can do a really good job of, of measuring this and interpreting the seismograms in this way in a global tomographic sense. And so what you do notice, though, is that these models are somewhat different. And there are, there are areas that agree. There are areas that disagree. And so in the study that I'm going to show you is we're sort of looking in a slightly more precise way, uh, but with a lot less data. So let's, uh, with, with that in mind, let's then move on to talk about why it was considered that the transition zone in general should, shouldn't show this strong anisotropy when, when clearly now we know that it does in some description. Well, really, that was because it wasn't obvious what would cause anisotropy in the transition zone. Um, if we think about the sort of ambient transition zone away from the slabs where we might expect the composition to be something like pyrolite, the minerals that are present in any great volume in this part of the Earth, well, ringwoodite is essentially isotropic. There's no way, real way of generating the values of anisotropy that we see with that. What is it like? could be, but it, it doesn't seem in experiments so far to strongly form texture, although you know, things change very quickly in the world of deformation experiments. Meanwhile, uh, the major right phase of garnet is also incredibly anisotropic uh, as far as minerals go. And so, uh, and calcium proscite, which is sort of ever the bridesmaid but never the bride of mantle mineral phases, but it probably isn't really voluminous enough throughout the transition zone to, to have a strong contribution to the anisotropy there either. So we're left with this sort of puzzling situation, which is that the largest volume, perhaps, of the, the transition zone doesn't host minerals which could really form a strong texture and become 
seismically anisotropic. So, and just to sort of show you how long this sort of puzzle's been going on for, I can show you a plot from Steve Kirby's uh, review paper on olivine metastability. And because really, until now, metastable olivine has been probably one of the best candidates to explain why you could have anisotropy in the transition zone, and therefore it would only occur in slabs, and only in slabs that are cold enough to, to host metastable olivine for any sort of large volume within the transition zone. So let's, let, now I'm going to talk, that's what's, you know, that's sort of the, the puzzle, and I'm going to show you now some, some new results that, that maybe, or maybe don't, place some constraints on what's going on. So we're going to use shear wave splitting. The shear wave splitting is a, is a phenomenon which uh, occurs in the presence of seismic anisotropy, or indeed any anisotropy, uh, where there's uh, shear going on. So just like optic birefringence, uh, a wave that travels through an anisotropic region splits into to two waves, a, a fast wave in blue here and a slow wave in red. Fast wave travels faster, and so on the other side, we can measure that there's a delay time between the fast and slow shear waves, and we can also measure the orientation of the fast wave. Now, these, these values here are going to depend on how big your box is, for a start. Also, how strongly anisotropic that medium is in that particular direction, and that's sort of the extra information that, that we can get out by using both the orientation and the amount of splitting. So this is, this is sort of the, the extra info that we're hoping to be able to get here. And really, the, I mean, the key with anisotropy is that some sort of ordering has occurred. You've either aligned crystals or inclusions or something like that. And that tells you that there's some sort of organized process happening, putting energy in to make a material organized. And you can contrast that with the sort of ambient idea of the mantle just uh, in hydrostatic equilibrium with no texture, we shouldn't, we shouldn't get it. So it tells you that a process is happening to organize the material. So this is the, this is the uh, sort of overview of our, our method, therefore. And what we're doing is looking at anisotropy in the region of deep earthquakes. And in this study, I'm only going to look at earthquakes deeper than 200 kilometers. So we're covering the transition zone. We're not looking at that sort of upper, upper 200 kilometers of the mantle here, I'm afraid. Now, part of the reason for that is that we know that the the upper mantle is anisotropic basically everywhere. And that's probably because olivine is quite strongly anisotropic and forms the texture fairly well. So we want to avoid sampling that region on the source side here. So this, this is the earthquake, and we, we measure it, this direct S wave at the seismometer. Now, we can do quite a good job of correcting the upper mantle on the receiver side, so we can take away the, uh, the green anisotropy over here. But if we were to look at earthquakes much shallower, it'd be much more difficult to uh, remove that. So that's why we focus on 200 kilometers and below. So in this region, uh, the earthquake occurs, and as it, as it travels down into the lower mantle, it accrues some sort of shear wave splitting from the anisotropy that's present. Now, it's fairly good, fairly good assumption, and indeed most of these global models agree, that the lower mantle doesn't host concerted strong anisotropy everywhere, so what we can do is, is assume, essentially, that the anisotropy we measure at the end, the splitting we measure, is due to the source region. And so that's what these measurements are. Okay, so we're looking at the, the region of the source. Now, as always, with shear wave splitting, in theory, the splitting could occur anywhere along the path. And our job is to sort of try and work out where this is localized. So these are the earthquakes that we actually used in our, in our study. And as you see, it's a sort of a few years ago that uh, most of this was done. So there's 100, 130 deep earthquakes in the end that produced usable measurements that were really, really high quality. One of the real keys in this type of study is that because you need to correct for this upper mantle on the receiver side, you need to be very, very sure of the, the splitting that occurs for underneath the stations. And because we're interested in transition zone anisotropy, we want to avoid stations where subduction zones are. Often people put a lot of stations on subduction zones because they're tectonically interesting. So we, uh, we're sort of limited in exactly which stations we can use. And we end up with a coverage of the world that looks a bit like this. So the first thing I'm going to do is uh, show you some sort of broad outline overall results that we got. And it's nice to have a hypothesis that you're going to investigate when you do these things. Now, um, what I'm just going to show you is the amount of splitting for each uh, earthquake station pair against the depth of the earthquake. Now, when I sort of started this, I thought, well, you know, my, my idea was that probably uh, 
either we're, we're looking at an effect of the actually the lower mantle or we're looking at an effect of the slab. And if it's the slab, it's probably olivine, say, in the slab that would give us the splitting that we observe. And so what we'd expect is something like this, where you know, have a sort of fairly constant amount of splitting, and then when you, when you get in the transition zone, that just dies away with depth as the amount of olivine decreases. And equally, you could imagine something a bit different. You could even imagine that uh, somehow texture sort of dies away, and then there isn't any splitting in the transition zone, which would be the old-fashioned view from a long time ago. What we actually see is this, which is no trend with depth. Okay, and this is robust, and what I've, I've got, you know, please ask me at the end, I've got all the, all the regions separately. Um, what the different colours just are the different regions that we see. Now, this scatter actually reduces when you take into account the azimuth that the waves take. Um, the elastic tensor is a four tensor, and so it's sort of quite complicated, uh, and this is what often produces this perceived scatter. But what, what this tells you, number one, is that the transition zone either within or around the slabs, is anisotropic. If you think a little bit harder as well, the fact that this, we have strong splitting right at the base of the transition zone, where and the, the waves go downward away, tells you also that this effect, not all of the effect at least, and probably none of it, is actually due to the sort of ambient mantle around the earthquake in the transition zone over a large area, because we're not sensitive to that for these deeper events. This is the amount of splitting. But what is F? That's seconds. Oh, that's just, okay, seconds. So I'm a physicist, so I always write the units. So this, this is then, this is non-dimensional now because it's depth divided by kilometers. I know about this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I know a lot of people like to put it in brackets, and I'm just okay. like kind of weird like that, I know. OK, so sorry about that. Yeah, so this, that's the amount of splitting in seconds. OK, thank you for the question to clarify that. Um, so yeah, so, uh, and I was saying that therefore, probably the splitting is actually it's either in the lower mantle or it's just around the event. So those, those are the two possibilities that are left now already just by looking at the data this way. So um, I'm going to not talk about that yet. So we've already sort of ruled out some of the options for causing splitting in the sort of transition zone gen more generally. And really, the, the sort of there's a, these are probably the reasonable candidate, so it could be metastable olivine perhaps, or, or possibly it's just an effect of LPO, say, in Bridgmanite at the top of the lower mantle. Well, the reason I sort of question mark this one, the Bridgmanite explanation, is because you need a, a big region, actually, to produce the amount of splitting we observe that's quite strongly textured. Um, this is, as you'll see, this is a problem with all the results anyway, but it's, it's not a slam dunk necessarily that this is what's going on for these particular measurements and I'm really looking forward to the next talk actually because uh, as you'll see I don't want to steal anyone's thunder but there's an interesting comparison there. So some of the other uh, and you know this list could go on and on in some ways there are lots of other more interesting uh, in some ways phases such as these dense hydrous magnesium silicates uh, D superhydrous B A the uh, you know, hydrous aluminum phases also, uh, garnet in the Akimotoite, uh, which is the Ilmenite form, or it could equally be aligned inclusions of contrasting seismic properties that would give us this as well. So those are all things that we choose to investigate. So what we do is we take elastic constants for these different cases, so from the literature, from uh, physical experiments, from ab initio calculations, and where we have them, we use the textures produced either in experiments or calculations, and we test how they fit our data. So uh, some of the ones I'm going to show you now are sort of a, a general transverse isotropy, um, but also um, the experiments that have been done on acimotomite in phase D, where they've been, uh, where there's uh, uniaxial shortening, so sort of compression, giving you a, a sort of hexagonal symmetry. Also, I'm going to show you for sheared bridgmanite, uh, and then again, this is for, from, from ex, um, combination of experiments and calculations. So what we do is we take our target elastic tensor, and we know the path taken by the S wave away from the earthquake in that region, and we simply, for all different orientations, we rotate the crystal, and we produce synthetic splitting in that S wave, just like for the data, and we can compare that to the observed splitting, and we have a a misfit, a sort of penalty function that we try to minimize. Uh, this is a 
Misfit designed for Shiro splitting, so feel free to ask if you want to know about that. And we do that for all for all the uh, all the observations which each have a different azimuth and incidence angle away from this this bit of the Earth that we're imagining. Now, something that emerged as we did this is that what's quite important and which changes the sort of coherence of the results is which reference frame you take when you do these calculations. Now, uh, I apologise for the uh, the east arrow, which has had a bit of identity crisis and is, is pointing north. Um, so one reference frame you could imagine would just be the geographic reference frame. But slabs aren't great respecters of north and east, and nor is Barbara's version of Keynote. Um, so a much more sensible thing to do would be to have a reference frame where you take the slab strike into account. And the other direction would be sort of the dip direction. So it should actually point over here and, uh, and up. So we did, we did this, but we actually found that uh, our results are more self-consistent if you also take the slab dip into account. And so we have a reference frame where we have a slab strike, we have normal to the slab, and we have an up dip direction. Okay, so now I'm just going to sort of explain properly what, what this means. So what we can do is plot all of our results in this, this slab frame. Now this is a slab, side view, and so the strike is into the page. And this is a lower hemisphere through that slab, and this is a, another view of that lower hemisphere. So this line down the middle is the intersection of that slab with that lower hemisphere. So down dip is in the, is in the middle of this plot, and uh, it would plot in the center of our lower hemisphere. So let's just take a few examples. So if we had something which is within the slab but pointing a bit along slab strike, that would be where this red dot is. It would plot over here, but you'd still, be, you'd still have a ray leaving this zone that goes down the slab. Now, if we had something which sort of came out in the back arc direction a little bit and was, uh, was perpendicular to the slab strike, it would plot where this red dot is and, and come out like here. And equally, any, any ray that leaves this region normal uh, at 90 degrees to the slab is going to plot on the edge. And if it's going right in the, the back arc direction, it's going to plot on the left here. Okay. So it takes a little while to get your head around this, this sort of projection. But this is, uh, this by, when you plot things in this frame, by far the most sort of coherency emerges between our results. So now let's actually look at our results. So this is... Uh, the amount of splitting again, so darker colours indicate more splitting or sort of stronger shear wave anisotropy in that direction um, for all of our data. Now, the first thing you notice is that there's a lot of grey here. Now, just because of the, um, the earth, the way, the way it is and where the continents and subduction zones are, very, we have almost no sensitivity to the top, the mantle above the slab in the transition zone. So we just can't really say anything about that. But we do have much more sensitivity to stuff going out the back. And actually, sometimes, depending on the slab dip, we have rays that go straight out the back, and they, they plot on the edge here. Now, what you notice is that uh, there's very strong splitting in this direction when you go straight out the back of the slab. And you then have a sort of a ring of small splitting and then another ring of high. Um, now, the sort of the anisotropists amongst you will recognize this as the pattern that's uh, predicted by sort of layered inclusions or or even sort of you know layered structures like uh, like micas or something like that. So this is a pattern we actually see, uh, for example, in shale reservoirs and in other situations where we have good coverage of the sphere in a similar way. But we're not just going to eyeball it. We're going to actually go through that procedure that I spent the time telling you about to invert the orientations of different different candidate phases. So this is all the data globally. Um, there's not a huge amount of data right now. There have been a lot of deep earthquakes recently, so what we will do is go back and update this uh, at some point. I have a student working on that, and uh, hopefully, those, hopefully that can fill in some of these gaps. Who knows? So if we do take a, a approach where we fit the data, we can plot up this penalty function, this misfit. And so what we're looking for is the regions of blue that fit our data best, and this color this lower hemisphere, again, in the same reference frame, is uh, coloured by the rotational symmetry axis of this hexagonal symmetry here. So what that's saying is that if you have uh, a medium which is hexagonally symmetric, the rotation axis, the symmetry axis, 
would be in this direction relative to the slab. That's what this sort of minimum point here is saying. So what we have is a sort of um, down dip, but slightly more vertical symmetry axis. And that's, that's sort of totally consistent with uh, layering or some sort of shortening that happens down, down dip or perhaps slightly, slightly more vertical than that, which itself is entirely consistent with most P axes for these events at the base of the transition zone. So our results are totally consistent with shortening, vertical shortening at the base of the transition zone. That's what, if it's occurring within the slab, that's what that orientation tells you. Now we can do the same for all of those different candidate phases I told you about. For instance, uh, this, is, this is for phase D. And uh, because we're using real textures, the symmetry in that is slightly lower. And we get sort of two different points, interestingly pointing two points along strike, both match our data sort of equally well. But again, it's, the symmetry axis is going to be pointing in some direction down, mostly down dip with a little bit off in the sort of shortening direction that we seem to see. So this is, this is very interesting. So what we, what we also did was investigated the sort of potential for there to be a uh, thermal control on this. Now, if there's a thermal control, as you go down, you should see, you should see less splitting. But, but what we're doing is we're accounting for the fact that our rays go in different directions. And the shear wave splitting is going to vary with direction depending on the elastic tensor. So we, we can be a bit cleverer than that than just looking at those splitting times, those delta Ts. So just to sort of, you sort of summarize the data in terms of the slab thermal parameter here, so big numbers mean sort of colder core of the slab at a given depth. Um, again, the amount of splitting uh, on this side, it, it doesn't really seem to vary systematically with this thermal parameter. Um, now that's just delta T. What we can do is make that uh, sort of independent of the orientations of the shear waves that leave the region and invert for the amount of olivine, say, that we would need. Uh, so this was this was done actually with um, with some real textures from a, a uh, prototype that uh, Ben Ismail and Main Price uh, produced the texture of, and this is the sort of the layer thickness you need of that of that thing to produce the splitting that we observe, and again there's not really any clear depth dependent variation in that. It doesn't seem like anything that should be thermally controlled. Is responsible. So, so this this to me sort of feels like if it's uh, if it's metastable olivine which is causing our observations, it, that doesn't seem very likely. But who's to say that olivine has to preserve the texture that far down, or indeed has to actually be the cause of the anisotropy? So on its own, this this doesn't rule anything in or out. But it is it does say that probably what we're seeing isn't metastable olivine causing the splitting itself. Okay, so. Okay, thank you. And so, um, the, I mean, we, uh, the explanation that we sort of favoured is that, you know, there's plenty of ways now of uh, creating these exotic uh, alphabet phases by having lots of water in your slab. And, and we, you know, if we, we could sort of calculate the amount of water that would be required to produce the um, splitting that we observed if it's some of these hydrous phases within the slab, this is a, a long ja slab geotherm. You can have a sort of a continuum of hydrous phases that are typically are sort of hexagonal layered structures that are very anisotropic. And if you if you do say how much water do you need, for instance, it's a lot. I mean, it, you know, you can you can easily uh, fit in. The, these are sort of weight percents. You can easily fit billions and tons of water per year down into the lower mantle if you require that to produce the splitting we observe. So that's, um, but that's, you know, that's just one number. And, and really, we're, we're still in the case of puzzling slightly over exactly what's causing this. So if I were to sort of summarize uh, where we are with uh, these observations, I think the key point really is that our orientations are sort of sub-parallel as if you have layers, as if there's sort of vertical shortening. And that's what the results are consistent with. And uh, there's, there's some uncertainty about what's going on above the slab. And it could be that the upper mantle is being deformed, but you need a lot of it to be deformed over a long region. So that's why we sort of favor something to be in the region of the slab. 
So I'll finish there and again just leave up that plug for the meeting in May. Thank you very much.